John chapter 7, and we'll begin reading in verse 30. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that he said, Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. In John chapter 7, Jesus is once again asserting who he is. He is the only begotten Son of God. He's the Savior. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the one in whom we place our hope and our faith for salvation. His message in John chapter 7 gets mixed reactions. Some people believe and some people accept him as Christ. Some don't believe. But one thing we see in John chapter 7 is that they're all talking about him. In this passage, we learn that there is an expiration date on God's invitation. We learn what the Lord is inviting us to, and we learn about his preeminence. We learn about how he's first and foremost. We learn that there's an expiration date on the Lord's invitation. If you look in verse 33, Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. The people in Jerusalem were in a special time and place. They were in a time and place where they got to see Jesus. They got to see him. They got to hear him talk. They got to hear him speak. They got to listen to his teachings. They got to listen to his sermons. They had the opportunity to ask him questions. It was a blessed place to be. Have, can you think of somebody in history that somebody you may look up to that you would have loved to have been able to hear them speak in person or you would have loved to have been able to sit down and talk to them or ask them questions? I can think of preachers that have gone on before us that I would have loved to have heard them preach or loved to have heard them teach a lesson or to have been able to ask them questions or to get to know them on a better level. I mean, you, you think of uh, great preachers like J. Vernon McGee. I get to hear his sermons on the radio, but what would it have been like to sit in on a service at the Church of the Open Door? You, uh, you, great preachers all throughout time, great political leaders all throughout time, social leaders. I mean, what would it have been like to actually be at the March on Washington, you know, and to hear Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak in person? The people of Jerusalem had something far greater than that. They had something far greater than that opportunity. They had the opportunity to see, to interact with, to hear, and to ask questions of the only begotten Son of God. And they, they went and they heard him speak. They heard him teach. They asked him questions. But what Jesus was telling them is that this time was coming to a close. That the day was coming that he wasn't going to be among them anymore. See, Jesus was going to die on the cross for their sins. And these people were missing the point. But he would die on the cross for their sins. He would be buried. He would rise again the third day, ascend to be at the right hand of the throne of God. And after that, he would no longer be among them. 
And when Jesus rose to be at the right hand of the throne of God, hard times came upon Israel and came upon Jerusalem after that. The time was coming that he would no longer be around. And so they needed to take that opportunity to trust him, to follow him, and to learn from him. Now that's what this meant to them back then when he said, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. He's saying your time here is limited. Your time to hear the teachings is limited. Your time to believe, your time to follow, your time to learn is limited. And that's what he was telling the people of Jerusalem in that day. Now for us today, this also teaches us that our time is limited. Our time is limited to accept God's invitation. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you still have opportunity at this exact moment. But that opportunity could close, and it will close without warning. Once your life here on this earth is done, then wherever you stand with the Lord, that's where you will stand for eternity. If you leave this life, if your life on this earth ends and you never knew Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will never know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you die without being a child of God, you will never be a child of God. Do not put off the decision to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior because you don't know when the curtain will close on that opportunity. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, Call ye upon him while he is near. The Lord will not always be found. The Lord will not always be near in the sense that you can approach him. Because when you die, the Bible says it's appointed unto a man once to die and then the judgment. When you die, it's judgment day at that moment. When Christ returns, it's judgment day at that moment. And there'll be no more time for repentance. There'll be no more time to accept him as Savior. There'll be where you are at that particular moment in time. That's where you'll be for eternity. And so man today, mankind today, men and women today need to understand that there is urgency to our message. We have a tendency to think that we're going to live forever. You know, the average age that a person lives to in the United States, I believe, is around 71 or 72. By that logic, I have almost 40 years left, Right. But not everybody lives to be 74 years old. Not everybody lives to be 77 years old. I may die tomorrow. I may die next week. I may die 40 years from now. I may live to be 100. We don't know. But it's that uncertainty that teaches us that we need to have our eternity settled with God. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, today needs to be the day that you turn from your sins and you trust Jesus as your Savior. And you say, well, Leland, I've already accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. My question is, have you been living for him? If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, but you haven't been living for him, you don't have to waste any more of your time. You know, we only have a certain amount of time on this earth. We only have a certain amount of time to live life. We only have a certain amount of time to experience things, to see things, to spend time with our families, to spend time with our kids, to spend time with our grandkids, to spend time with our parents, to spend time with our grandparents. We have a limited amount of time. But moreover, we have a limited amount of time to live for the Lord, to honor and glorify the Lord, and to do the things on this earth for which he rewards us in heaven. We have a limited amount of time. Don't waste your time on this earth. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 through 16 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That word circumspectly means diligently. The Bible says to walk circumspectly or to walk diligently. To walk means to live. It means how you go about your day-to-day -day lives. All right? Live diligently. What does it mean to live diligently? It means to live a life that is paying attention, a life that is paying attention to detail, a life that is paying attention to God and what God wants us to do. So many people live life like a summer day. If you can remember back being kids when you had summers off and you started the summer and summer was over, you know, just about as quickly as it started. 
you started off summer and you're like, yay, we're out of school for three months. I'm going to do this, this, and this. And the next thing you know, your mom's taking you shopping for school supplies. And that was always kind of a sad day because you knew the school year was coming. And you look back over those three months and we just didn't get everything done we wanted to do. A lot of people live life like that. They live life like a school child lives summertime, not really giving a thought to the day before or the day ahead or the day as it is and using the time the way it ought to be used. We are to live diligently. We are to walk circumspectly. We are to live a lifestyle that is paying attention, that is plugged into God, that is using our time wisely. Using our time wisely and spending it with our families, using our time wisely in reaching the lost people around us, using our time wisely in using our talents and our abilities to honor and glorify God. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 16, See then that you walk circumspectly or live diligently, not as fools. Now a fool is one who just floats through life. Whatever happens, happens. Whatever comes, comes. And they never quite see the connection between the choices they make and the consequences they reap as a result. They just kind of go through life. They just kind of float through. They just kind of exist. And God doesn't want us to just exist. He wants us to live. He wants us to do. He wants us to use our time. And so see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. To redeem the time means to make the most of it. And we need to make the most of it because we don't have much of it left. You know, I'll look back at my first 34 years, and they went quickly. And I wasted a lot of those 34 years, you know. There are decisions I wish I could go back and make and do it over again. Decisions like I would have gotten a geology class and made better than a D. I would have stayed in school and finished that degree. You know, I, I wouldn't have spent so much money at Applebee's and Chili's. I mean, I ran up a $1,500 credit card one month d doing that. I was in college. I had a credit card. I didn't quite learn the concept of annual percentage rate, okay? And so, you know, had to, had to pay that off. The, the, I would have, you know, stayed with certain jobs longer. I would have taken the time to learn more. I would have set myself up to where God could use that to b benefit me and bless me today. I wasted a lot of time, but 34 years has gone quickly, and it's moving faster, and it's moving faster, and I don't know how much time I have left. Maybe I do have 40 years left, okay, but that 40 years is going to go quickly. I can't change the decisions I made in skipping out of geology class and in not going to school and in not finishing my degree and in changing jobs every six months from the time I was 18 to the time I was 25. I, I can't go back and change those decisions. What I can do is look at the situation I'm, I'm in now, look at the decisions that are before me now, and make wise decisions today. I can redeem the time. I can make the most of the time that I have left. Yeah, you, know, you know, the average age of an American, I think, you know, the average American lives to be in their lower 70s. Anywhere from 71 to 74, the age fluctuates through, through the years. And you may say, well, I've lived beyond the average age of the American. I'm, I'm almost out of here. Graduation day is right around the corner, Leland. I don't care if you have two days or 20 years left. Make the most of it. Make it count. So walk circumspectly. Live diligently, redeem the time, make the most of it because we don't know how much is left and we know that the curtain will close. And when the curtain closes, when the Lord returns or when he calls you home, that is where you stand in that day is where you will stand with the Lord for eternity. And what do you want to hear? Do you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Or do you want to hear, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you? Make your calling and election sure. Settle eternity with the Lord. Trust him as Savior. And if, if you have not trusted him as Savior, and if you have trusted him as Savior, make sure you're using your time 
to the best of your ability to honor and glorify the Lord. So there is an expiration date on the Lord's invitation. Then we look at what the Lord invites us to do. The Lord invites us, first of all, to trust him. If you look in verse 37, Jesus says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Let him come unto me. That's the great invitation that the Lord extends. Come unto me. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest for your souls. I think is how the verse goes. He invites people to come unto him. He invites us to come unto him. He invites those who, are, who labor, those who are weary, those who are heavy laden, those who are struggling, those who are sick, those who are discouraged. He invites them to come unto him. He invites us to turn to him. To turn to him means to trust him. The Lord wants us to turn to him and trust him. The first thing you trust the Lord for is salvation. The nail that you hang your proverbial hat on to get you into heaven is the fact that the Lord died for your sins on the cross. He's the one that's going to get us into heaven. We're not the ones that's going to get us into heaven. He's the one that's going to get us into heaven. I think I told you all the story about the girl I knew on Facebook that said it's up to me to get me and my family in heaven. That is a burdened place to be because it is impossible. It does not matter how I dress my kids, whether or not I let them watch a television, whether or not I let them on the internet, how many times I sit down to them with Bible lessons on a daily basis, how I make them fix their hair, and I think y'all probably noticed that I'm not real diligent on how the kid's hair gets fixed some days. I've got one. If I don't buzz it, I don't know what to do with it. But, but he knows what to do with it, so he's, he's doing his thing. But it does not matter how I dress them, how I groom them, how I talk to them. I cannot get my kids into heaven. Only the Lord can get them into heaven. Only the Lord can get me into heaven. There's a preacher that preaches on the radio around here, and he's telling his congregation how to get into heaven. They have to believe. They have to be baptized. They have to be members of the church. They have to do this. They have to do that. And they have to do the other thing. And the Lord never said, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. What did the Lord say? He said, come unto me. Turn ye unto me. Repent and believe. He that believes on the Son of God is saved. He that believes not is condemned. That's what the Lord taught about salvation. If that plan of salvation that that man preaches on the radio is true, then Jesus preached false salvation the entire three and a half years he was on this planet. He wants us to turn to him for salvation. He's the one we trust for salvation. It is by grace that ye are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's by God's grace through your faith, through your trust in the Lord that you are saved and not of yourselves. It's God's gift to us. We trust him for salvation, but on top of salvation, we trust him to meet our needs. Now, we're worried in today's time because the price of gas has skyrocketed at $3.55 since the start of this month. I think earlier this month we were paying about three twenty-five dollars or something. I mean, we're up about $0.30. Cents. We are up about $0.50 cents since this year started, okay, per gallon. And some of y'all are driving up here in pickup trucks and larger vehicles. My, my vibe, price of gas goes up $0.50 cents a gallon. It hits me to the tune of about $2 or $3 per per tank of gas because it just doesn't use a lot. But if you're driving a pickup truck, and I did for many years, it goes up 50 cents a gallon. It hits you to the tune of about 10, 15, 20 dollars per tank of gas. And so I get that. And so we're worried about finances. We're worried about politics. They keep talking about the fiscal cliff and budget sequestration and What's going to happen with Social Security? Will Social Security still be there when I get old enough to collect it? Will it be there if you're collecting it now? Will it be there again for you next year? Are they going to cut your budgets or your, your benefits? Or are they going to make you pay a greater share of Medicare that you can't afford to pay already? What's going to happen, right? And so we worry about all these things. And what did Jesus tell us about worrying? He said, take no thought for tomorrow. Suffice it to the day is the evil thereof. That means today's got enough trouble. Don't worry about tomorrow. So let the Lord 
worry about Social Security. Let the Lord worry about Medicare. Let the Lord worry about the price of gas because the Lord sees the big picture and he's going to meet your needs and he's going to supply your needs. Trust him for that. You trust him for your provisions today. The model prayer, the Lord's prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray said, give us this day our daily, not weekly, not monthly, not yearly food, but give us this day our daily bread. Trust the Lord to meet your needs on a daily basis. You can trust him to meet your needs, and you look to him, you turn to him, you go to him for fulfillment in life. Money will not give you security. There's an investment house, investment firm, something. They, they, what they do is they, get, they take your money and they put it in annuities. And you live off of the interest, the annual percentage yield. And they've got a rock bottom interest rate of about 3% per year. And so if you invest your money with them, whatever money you put in there, you get 3% back. And so if you put $3 million in annuities with this company, that's 3% of that's about 90000 a year. So you're thinking, that's security, right? If I could guarantee myself $90,000 a year for the rest of my life, life would be good. But there's no security in that. First of all, we don't know how safe those bonds are. Second of all, we have this little thing called inflation, which things, you know, money that's good money now won't be good money down the road because the money won't be as valuable. And that's one of the things that investors who t teach you about about investing for retirement, that's one thing they warn you about, is keep your money growing because you have to outpace inflation. And so what's the lesson we learned there? You've always got to be finding more money, right? Money doesn't bring security. And that's why rich people are always looking for more money. It's not that they're greedy. It's that they haven't found the security that they were looking for in the millions that they've already made. Money doesn't bring you security. The Lord brings you security. Things, new things, gadgets, Things you buy from Walmart, this really, this really, really neat thing that we just bought, it's cool until the newness of it wears off. You ever bought a new computer, and that new computer is as fast as a Lamborghini until you've had it for a few months, and all of a sudden it's slow, right? And it's outdated, and it's obsolete. Apple comes out with an iPad. Then they come out with the iPad 2. Then they come out with the iPad mini. And then we find out that the Samsung Galaxy phone does all the stuff that the iPads won't do. You get the iPod and then the iPod Touch. And, I mean, there's so many different gadgets on the market today. And everybody's got to have the latest one. And it's really neat until the next one comes out. The iPhone was really neat. Then they came out with the 2. Then they came out with the iPhone 3. Then the iPhone 4. Now everybody's got to have the iPhone 5. Is it 4G capable? I don't even know what 4G is. But if, if it, is it 4G capable? If it's not 4G capable, it does, you know, it's no good. It's old-fashioned. It's a dinosaur. New things only bring satisfaction until they're not new anymore. We need to look to the Lord for satisfaction. Drugs and alcohol do not make the troubles go away. They do not make the troubles stay away. They only create more problems. Success last only for a moment oh uh, Pittsburgh Steelers Terry Bradshaw quarterback won the Super Bowl his dad said Terry you must be proud of yourself you're the quarterback of the winning Super Bowl team and Terry Bradshaw was depressed and he wrote about this and he discussed this in a documentary later on when he won that Super Bowl that was the most depressed feeling he ever had because he knew if he didn't turn around and win the Super Bowl again next year, they were going to run him out of Pittsburgh. Success is fleeting. Watched the movie Eight Seconds. Watched part of the movie Eight Seconds about a bull rider named Lane Frost, who was from Texas. World champion bull rider. When he won that world championship, he was under pressure because everybody's expecting him to be that good for the, for the, for the, from that time on. Success doesn't bring you fulfillment. Only the Lord brings you fulfillment. When you learn to walk with the Lord, when you learn to lean on Him, to trust Him, to walk with Him, and to turn to Him, and to look to Him for guidance, and look to Him for that fulfillment, you'll find yourself fulfilled in situations 
you never before thought possible. You'll find yourself a field eating beans and rice. It's, it's a, eating beans and rice. It's a good life. Ten years ago, you couldn't have imagined a meal without steak on the table. But here you are eating beans and rice, and this is, this is a good day. This is a fulfilling day. This is a peaceful day. Why? Because you've learned to take your fulfillment from God and not from the sirloin or not from the ribeye or not from the house or not from the car. He invites us to trust him. He invites us to receive the spirit, which is the context of verses 37 and 38. Receiving the spirit happens at salvation. When you trust Jesus Christ as your personal savior, the Bible teaches that the spirit seals itself to your spirit and you become the child of God. But that doesn't mean that every child of God walks in the spirit or walks according to the spirit. But if you believe on Christ and you are walking in the Spirit, verse 38, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The Spirit guides us, prepares the way for us, teaches us, blesses our efforts, and if we trust the Spirit to work things out in our lives, that's the equivalent of trusting Christ. These people were thirsty and Jesus compares this to he compares the spiritual thirst to physical thirst and these people they were, they were thirsty my commentary says that during this feast they would take water from the pool of Siloam and take it up to the temple and pour it in this uh, silver basin now I don't know about that uh, it's not mentioned in the scriptures anywhere but let's say they did that okay on the last day of the feast, the day that Jesus is doing this, they, were not, they didn't do that on the last day of the feast. So you have an empty basin of water. So there's no water there. And Jesus says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly should flow rivers of living water. And y'all thought y'all were wondering where I got that song from on Wednesday night. What Jesus is saying is he has the cure for spiritual thirst and he's given the imagery of what it would be like to be able to create water yourself to drink. And he's saying he can do that on a spiritual level if we'll just turn to him. We look at Lake Brownwood. There's some water in there, so we should be thankful for that. But it's still ten and a half feet low. Well, what are we going to do? Where are we going to find water? The city of Brownwood is trying to figure out how to recycle wastewater. The Brown County Water Improvement District is trying to figure out if they can drill into the ground, get salt water, and get the salt out of it. We're trying to find different ways of water. What if we could just make water? What if we could just put up a building and this building makes water? would never run out, right? On a spiritual level, that's what Jesus can do for us spiritually if we will turn to him and if we will trust him. Now, in this passage in John chapter 7, some people believed on him and some people didn't. But the thing that we see about this is that they're all talking about him. In verses 40 and 41, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Some believed he was a prophet. Some believed that he was the prophet like unto Moses. But they didn't accept him as Christ. They didn't accept him as Savior. But they accepted him as prophet. And there are a lot of people today who see Jesus as a great teacher, they see him as a prophet. In fact, there was controversy at the Brownwood School Board last Monday night because one of the school board's sons was taught that the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, they all worship the same God, and they all hold Jesus in high regard, so let's just everybody get along together. That's a lesson in the C-Scope curriculum that's been so controversial. Um, it's important to know what our kids are learning. And this school board member, he was asking about this lesson. You know, what's being taught? And he, he, he was being nice about it. He's saying, I just want to know what my child was taught so I can know how to talk to my son about what we believe as a family. But there are, and I say that to say this, there's conventional wisdom out there. There is educated, there is educated opinion out there that says, all worshiping the same God, all hold Jesus in high regard. Well, first of all, we're not all worshiping the same God. Allah is not the same God as God of the Bible. These, the, they have different characteristics altogether. Secondly, there is some truth to the fact that Muslims hold Jesus in high regard. The Jews see him as a great teacher and a great prophet. 
but they don't accept him as Savior. They don't accept him as Messiah. Many today are in that boat. They see Jesus as a great teacher, as a great figure, but they don't see him as the only begotten Son of God. And rejecting him as the only begotten Son of God and rejecting him as Savior is rejecting him altogether. You're not going to get into heaven by saying, but God, I thought he was a good teacher. God's not going to accept that. Some accepted him as Christ. Many accepted him as Messiah. Some accepted him as Savior, and some even followed. And many people today confess that Jesus is Christ. Many accept him as Savior, and some even spend their lives following him. That's the way of salvation. And then others reject him altogether and deny that he was anybody. But in that day and time, all these people in John chapter 7 are talking about him. Monday night at the Brownwood ISD school board meeting, they were talking about him. Kids in public schools, teachers in public schools, university professors are talking about him. Historians are talking about him. Religi religious leaders are talking about him. Political leaders are talking about him. 2,000 years later, we're all still talking about Jesus. If you have a man who is still being talked about on this widespread of a scope 2,000 years later, you might want to get to know about him. You should know him. You should accept him as Savior. Our time on this earth is short. Don't waste it. Don't waste the opportunity to accept Christ as Savior. Don't waste the opportunity to live in his blessings by following his will, by following his steps, by following his leadership and doing what it is that he's called us to do. Don't waste your time on this earth. You know, we look at the kids in school. They've got career technical education now. Kids at early are going to learn to be nurses before they even get out of high school. They get out of high school, a year later they can become a registered nurse. Kids at Brownwood got this thing called the STEM Academy, the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Academy, going to teach these kids to be engineers. They're going to go straight into engineering school right out of high school, okay? I mean, the kids today have all kinds of educational opportunities. My son is learning to program computers, to program robots, to tell it to pick up checkers. Do you know what I was doing in the fourth grade? I was learning to multiply double-digit numbers. I might have been just learning to add double-digit numbers. He's sitting here telling a little robot to go across this little mat, pick up this checker, move it over there, drop it in this specific little place, and he built the robot. I mean, kids today have all this education out there in front of them. And some of them are going to utilize it. Some of them are going to learn. And some of them are going to do great things with their lives. And some of them are going to waste their years of school and come out of school never learning a thing. And you look at that kid that wasted their school years and didn't learn a thing. How could you waste that opportunity for that education? People look at me and say, how could you waste that college education? You didn't finish. Why not? You were only a semester away. I made the bad, I made the, I did not make the decision to apply myself to finishing up my schoolwork. And we look at these situations, so how could you waste that opportunity? How could you blow that opportunity? God has given us the ultimate opportunity. We have our life and our time on this earth to trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and to live in his presence. Why on earth would you waste that time? Let's stand.